we're going to do it. I don't know exactly what we're going to open source or exactly when, but the direction of travel is towards more open models available. Sam Altman, taking questions at Tokyo University, drops a statement that really caught my attention. The, the progress over the, the recent scale is quite amazing. Our, our very first reasoning model um, was like a top one millionth competitive programmer in the world. People thought that was very impressive. It's like, wow, an AI, it's, you know, the millionth best people that do this, that's pretty good. Um, we then had a model that got to like a top 10,000. Uh, 03, which we talked about publicly in December, is the 175th best program competitive programmer in the world. I think our internal benchmark is now around 50, and maybe we'll hit number one by the end of this year. So that's like an amazing rate of scale for more compute in this new paradigm, and we don't see any signs of that stopping. He hinted at something big, something groundbreaking. Around the end of 2023, right when we were catching whispers about the QSTAR leaks, OpenAI was likely testing their first internal reasoning model of its kind. Think about that, an entirely new leap in AI reasoning. Now, while we don't have full access to the O3 model yet, I've been playing around with the O3 Mini, and let me tell you, I was blown away. The capabilities it demonstrates are next level. But here's the catch. These benchmarks, impressive as they are, are more like solving exam problems. They don't necessarily equate to full-scale software engineering solutions. And here's the crucial bit. This doesn't mean software engineers are on the chopping block. In fact, I firmly believe the opposite. Great software engineers won't just survive, they'll thrive. Tools like these will empower them to create more, innovate faster, and push boundaries we haven't even imagined yet. Altman also shared something jaw-dropping. Apparently, their internal model, whatever it's called, is already ranking as the 50th best coder in the world. And by the end of 2025, he's confident we'll have the number one. Yup, a superhuman coder. And not just in theory, this year, 2025, might actually be the year it happens. That said, it's important to put this into perspective. These models are solving highly specific bounded problems, like exam questions. Real-world software engineering projects? They're still a whole different beast, but the progress we're witnessing is nothing short of staggering. Before we dive deeper, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel for the latest and greatest updates in AI and tech. Let's talk about the game-changing potential here. Imagine someone who isn't an expert in coding, designing reinforcement learning systems, or building machine learning training pipelines. Maybe they don't know the technical details, but if they understand the concepts and can clearly communicate those ideas to a coding AI or a large language model, the AI can handle a huge chunk of the heavy lifting for them. That's wild, right? This means two big things. First, the best software engineers are about to level up in ways we've never seen before. They'll be able to build faster, smarter, and with fewer limitations. But here's the kicker. This also opens the door for more smart, creative people. People with brilliant ideas who never had the time, interest, or resources to learn coding. With tools like these, their ideas can finally come to life. Imagine all the untapped potential that could finally be unlocked. There are so many intelligent individuals out there who dream big, but just don't have the technical skills to build software or design machine learning pipelines. With AI stepping in as the ultimate collaborator, those barriers start to crumble. It's a huge enabler for creativity and innovation, and it's just the beginning. Now, let's switch gears for a second. Sam Altman brought up a fascinating question during his interview. With AI advancing so rapidly, what's left for us to be better at? Are there skills we should focus on mastering now that AI is stepping into so many domains? Let's dive into what he had to say. You know, in terms of specifics, like, are, are you going to, you know, are you going to be better at the AI at math or a better programmer than the AI on its own or better at physics? Um, the answer is no, you will not be better at any of those things. And so specific skills, uh, you'll be able to do things with AI that no one could do before. Um, and there'll be new ways to work with it. But like the raw, when a calculator was invented, there were people who said, I'm, you know, no matter how good this calculator gets, I'm gonna stay better at arithmetic. These people who are just really great at it. Um, and no one can outrun the calculator. But that was okay because, you know, we use the calculator and we start doing more complex math. 
in any given area, it'll be the same thing. You will not outrun the AI on raw horsepower. That's over. That's probably over this year. Um, but using the tools, you can do all sorts of new things that will just not be possible. Um, what I think it's going to be like is that every person has access to as if they ran the best, most competent company on earth. And you can go in the same way that if you ran that company, you can come up with ideas and ask the people that work at the company to do it and figure out how to like orchestrate that. You can do that with AI. So everybody can go do that. And amazing new things will come out of it. But the skills that you need in that world are figuring out what people want, sort of creative vision, quick adaptability, resilience as everything is changing around you. Um, and the and the sort of learning how to work with these tools to do way more than people could without it, but not trying to say like, I'm gonna outrun the calculator. And to me, the lesson in there, the, 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 the thing to take away now is just start using these tools. Start incorporating them into the way that you work, into the way that you study. When you're doing something new, ask yourself, is there a way that AI could help me do this faster? Do I need to be doing this myself or can I outsource it to AI? And you find yourself gradually getting more efficient. You learn new techniques. You stay up, you know, with the state of the art as AI changes, and you're going to be best fit and adapted to to working with AI in the future. On a similar note, Sam touched on the fascinating concept of co-evolution: AI and humans growing and advancing together. It's not about one replacing the other, but working in tandem to push the boundaries of what's possible. What's interesting here is they brought up Ethan Mollick, someone we've mentioned quite a bit on this channel. If you don't already follow him, you're missing out. His insights on platforms like X, formerly Twitter, are incredible. He's constantly publishing innovative research and sharing fresh ideas on how to make the most of AI in real-world applications. Seriously, his work is a treasure trove of inspiration. Let's dive into some of his key ideas and see how they tie into this broader discussion about humans and AI evolving together. Take a listen. I think co-evolution of society and technology is the exact right framework. It's it's not, I think that the wrong way to think about it is just like, this thing is gonna happen, it's gonna, and like, it's gonna beat us at everything. What will happen is it'll be like step by step evolving together and what we do will be unimaginable to people that used to have to work without this technology. Like think about what someone can do today relative to what someone was capable of a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago. Um, the the sort of the possibilities go up, the the expectation goes up too, um, and you have to learn how to work differently with these tools. But I think the ceiling is going to be very very high. By the way, there's a book um, there's a book called Co-Intelligence by a Wharton professor named Ethan Mollick. It's short. It's about a hundred pages, but it's got a, re a lot of really thoughtful um, writing about how he teaches with AI and how students can think about working with AI. I think it's well worth the read. This next part is absolutely fascinating. The discussion shifted to the idea of models being capable of in-context learning. Let me give you an example that really blew my mind. One of the Gemini models, after being trained, demonstrated the ability to learn a dead language. This is a language spoken by only a handful of people on the planet. It has no internet presence, no digital footprint at all, just some print books, grammar guides, and dictionaries. Here's the crazy part. The model was fed that limited data, and after processing it, it was able to generate sentences in the language, complete with proper grammar and structure. That's right. This AI essentially taught itself a dead language using only the sparse resources provided. Now, this raises a fascinating question. What happens in fields where there's very little data available? We know these models thrive on massive data sets. More text, more examples, more input. But what about niche fields or subjects with a limited amount of data? Here's the surprising takeaway. It might not be as big of a problem as we once thought. These models could still excel in such areas. Let's explore how and why this might be the case. Take a listen. Okay. One of the interesting things that we see is that as the models get smarter, you need fewer examples to, uh, to fine tune them, to make them, you know, to help them learn something new which is sort of intuitive when you think about it, right? If, if a model is increasingly intelligent, then it should need fewer new prompts to learn something new. So I actually think the trends are going in the right direction for very smart models to be able to learn new areas, whether it's construction management or anything else, off of a smaller number of data points. Next up, let's touch on some breaking news, quite literally. Just 30 minutes before this interview, OpenAI announced some fascinating deep research. The focus? 
What happens when you scale up compute power and push large language models even further? Here's where it gets interesting. As these AI models grow in complexity, they're not just processing data, they're starting to uncover new knowledge. Think about that. It's no longer just about learning from existing information. It's about discovering insights that even we might not have thought of. Let's break this down and explore the implications. What does it mean for the future of AI? And how far can this take us? We On uh, Friday, we launched O3 Mini AI. And I think that points to a lot of what future research will look like over the next six or 12 months. We will push small, incredibly capable, incredibly fast reasoning models as far as we can. Um, and, you know, right now those are mostly good at STEM, but they'll get good at, at everything else. Uh, we will bring all of the modalities together. So in the same model, you'll be able to have a voice stream going while it writes and compiles code for you in Canvas, and you'll be able to look at it that way. Um, it'll be able to be off browsing the internet. Uh, and then we'll continue to scale up models. So, you know, hopefully GPT-5, 6, whatever. Um, today, or I think actually like half an hour ago, we launched a new thing called Deep Research. Um, this, it's in the pro plan. Um, it will come to the plus tier at limits, but it's in the pro plan today. Uh, this is the second agent product that we've launched. And the uh, it's really quite, I think it's one of the best things we've ever launched. You can give this a task um, that you would have to spend many hours or days researching on the internet, thinking about finding stuff, and it'll come back with a report. Um, I It's not just good at doing like reports for school, but it is or really good at that. Um, it, it's pretty good across the board. It, it feels like a real agent. Um, I love uh, like 90s JDM cars. So I was in town this weekend and I wanted to find a specific one and I was having a really hard time and I was like, I'm going to try giving this to deep research. There's no way it's going to find me one. And I found the only three for sale in all of Japan, like with contact information ready to go. It was an amazing experience. So we'll do more agents like that. We'll continue to push on uh, agents that can do useful work for you autonomously. Um, We've talked about how the dream is to get to a coding agent. There's a lot of research still to get there, but I think that'll be a, a really like hugely important milestone. And overall, I hope that by, you know, the end of this year, we have a model that you can use. If you have the pro tier, you can turn the compute all the way up and you can ask it a really hard question. Not one that requires discovering new science, but most things short of that. And you kind of just get it to work. It may have to go off and think for a few hours. It may have to go use a bunch of tools but it kind of just does it for you. Um, we got a long way to go to get there. That's like a lot of scale, a lot more algorithmic progress, but I think it is achievable. Next, we dive into a fascinating topic, brain-machine interfaces and how they might shape the way we interact with AI in the future. As we continue advancing, there's this growing intersection between understanding how our brains function and how artificial neural networks operate. The overlap is becoming more apparent and we're starting to see real progress in connecting the two worlds. The possibilities here are mind-blowing. Imagine seamless communication between human brains and AI systems. What could that unlock for us? Let's take a look at the clip and unpack what this could mean. Um, on brain-machine interfaces, I think this is an incredible time to pursue that. I think that there is clearly, we're gonna figure something out. Um, and having like sort of direct access, it may take a while to an AI, as you think, is going to be incredible. Um, I'm skeptical of a lot of very destructive approaches, but I think there's some lighter ones where you'll kind of learn how to use the interface and it'll, there's so much that can like go into your brain over a low bit rate that we'll, we're, we're gonna figure this out. I think it's uh, the most interesting new companies I've seen in the last six months have been, have been in this direction. You wanna take the space one? Yeah, sure. I'm also very excited about uh, brain computer interfaces, by the way. Um, yeah, so actually, before I came to OpenAI, I was working at a company called Planet that built satellites and um, images the whole world every day. Um, and the most recent satellite that we launched has a GPU in it and is meant to do to run AI models in space uh, in order to you know more quickly send down results and things like that. Uh, I agree with you. It's challenging because the I mean we we're releasing a new model every three months at this point and your timelines for space are, are much longer. But as models get, I mean, we're getting better at, at putting more and more power into space. Rockets are getting bigger, so you can launch bigger satellites, bigger solar panels, and models are getting smaller, so you can run them more efficiently. So I think the answer is that everything is converging to there being more AI in space, and I think that's a pretty cool outcome. But to make a specific prediction, if we talk about the, you know 2025 and total intelligence on Earth, so all of the people, all of the coordination, all of the AI, just the total like 
the total intellectual capacity on Earth. Um, I would I would say that in 2035, maybe if the progress chart continues, then a single data center is smarter than the current total intellectual capacity of Earth. Now, in practice, you have to freeze it in time like that, because what's going to happen is we're going to learn all the way along there and we're all going to individually get more capable. Our companies are going to get more capable and that thing won't seem that impressive anymore. But if you could compare 2035, one big data center, to 2025, all of Earth, I think it would be astonishing. One of the areas that I believe will undergo a massive transformation thanks to AI is education. Have you heard of the Two Sigma problem? It's a fascinating idea. The notion that with just two fundamental changes, we could shift the quality of education for all kids two standard deviations to the right. That's an absolutely monumental improvement. So what are these two changes? First, moving away from a rigid, one-size-fits-all quarterly system and embracing mastery learning, where students progress at their own pace. And second, providing one-on-one -on -one personalized tutoring. Now before AI, these ideas were more of a pipe dream. Scaling something like personalized tutoring across millions of students would have required an incredible amount of human labor and resources, simply not practical for most schools or institutions. But with AI, this suddenly becomes not just possible, but incredibly feasible. By implementing these concepts, we could see almost immediate, transformative improvements in how education is delivered. Here's Sam Altman sharing his thoughts on the future of education with AI. Let's dive in. Education is one of the few areas we care about most. It, it's amazing to see already what's happening. Uh, but I think every student in the world, every person in the world can get a better educational experience than the best educational experience available today. The, if you see what's happening with their early personalized tutoring, uh, companies that are building on top of technologies like ours to sort of like help people learn in whatever the best style is and wherever their weak points are over their whole life. I think that's going to go very far. Um, students are some of the biggest users of ChatGPT and it, I think, so naturally appeals to, it's, it so naturally works for education. Uh, I know that not as much there has happened in Japan, but I'm excited and would encourage you all to go build those things. Uh, I, I think it'll be really wonderful. A hundred years out, it feels impossible to even conceptualize at this point. I think the world will be so totally, you know, there will be, I just cannot imagine, I can't conceptualize what the capabilities of AI in a hundred years will, will look like. In 10 years, uh, I think it will still have hugely changed the world. Uh, we will, we will see the, the rate of scientific progress, uh, scientific discovery, maybe go up by like a factor of 10 from where it is today, maybe a factor of a hundred, something like that. And if you believe that scientific, which I do, that scientific progress is the most important way that the economy of the world gets better, the economy grows sustainably, then to, to 10 or 100x that rate of progress, uh, I think is hard to conceptualize, but it'll be a super, the world will be moving faster for sure, and it'll be a super increase in quality of life. You know, and there'll be all these ways that it's super different, like the space probes will be leaving Earth, and you know, we'll have just like these amazing things happening, and anything you can imagine, the AI can figure out how to create. Uh, and then other than, you know, people will, still be living their daily lives in similar ways and still be like very motivated to, motivated to hang out with their friends and create families and have their hobbies. And so, so I think it'll be like, in some sense, everything will change. And in some other sense, what it means to be a human will change, like not at all. And we'll, I, I have no concerns that we'll run out of things to do or, you know, there won't be any more work or any more fulfillment. Like we, we will just, the landscape will have changed, the jobs will be different, but we'll still kind of function very much the same. So what do you think? Could we really have a superhuman coder by the end of 2025, essentially this year? Do you see this as a game changer that might disrupt software engineering careers and professions? Or do you believe, like many others, that this will be an incredible enabler, empowering people to achieve and create more? Do you think AI tools will transform how we create software without sidelining the human element? Or is there a bigger shakeup coming for the profession? Drop your thoughts in the comments. I'd love to hear where you stand on this. And if you made it this far, thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you enjoyed the discussion. I'll see you next time.